on your handout here. The Apocryphon of John is extant in four copies, three from the Nag Hammadi Corpus and one from the Berlin Codex. The Berlin Codex was discovered at the end of the 19th century, but was only published in 1955 in a German version. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the uh, Berlin Codex is now conventionally included. All of the four tractates in the Berlin Codex are included in uh, Nakamati Library in English and also Nakamati Scriptures. Now there are also two different recensions. There's a longer one reflected in codices 2 and 4 and a shorter one reflected in Codex 3 of Nakamati and Berlin Gnostic. The versions in codices 3 and 4 are very fragmentary and so we don't need to pay any attention to them uh, for our purposes here. In terms of literary genre, apoc the Apocryphon of John is an apocalypse, a revelation, containing secrets revealed by the risen Christ to his disciple John, son of Zebedee. Within the apocalyptic frame at the beginning and end of the text, there are two main sections, a revelation discourse and a commentary on Genesis 1 to 7. The commentary has been modified into a dialogue between Jesus and his interlocutor, John. A number of sources are reflected in the document as a whole, so there is some literary history in terms of the development of the version we now have. Some internal confusions are also evident and some differences between the versions. So uh, now in terms of your outline, um, as I've already pointed out, the stuff at the beginning and end is, is framework. The Apocryphon of John contains a basic Gnostic myth that has been Christianized by editorial editions and revisions. The Christianization of the Apocryphon of John can be seen from its literary structure. When we remove the apocalyptic framework at the beginning and the end, together with the dialogue features involving ten questions put to Christ by his interlocutor John, we are left with material in which nothing identifiably Christ Christian remains, except for some easily removed glosses. The first part, containing the Revelation Discourse, may originally have been a separate unit. And uh, it is this stuff that is uh, precisely parallel to Irenaeus' paraphrase of a text used by the Gnostics against Heresies 129. <clears throat> the second part, containing the dialogue, has some thematic parallels uh, to Irenaeus' treatment of so-called other Gnostics against Heresies 130. That part consists essentially of an esoteric commentary on Genesis 1-7, and this is expanded by material on the destiny of the soul that appears to have been interpolated into the commentary. The Anthropogony in the longer version contains material from a Book of Zoroaster, as it's called, and that's absent from the shorter version. Then there's a hymn, the hymn of Prot um, Pro Pronoia, and that's uh, also uh, absent from the shorter version. Christianizing glosses vary in extent from one version to the other. The heavenly Eon Autogenes, the Son, in the Sethian Divine Triad is identified with the pre-existent Christ in the first part of the Revelation Discourse. That identification is made initially in the shorter version, but is absent from the parallel passage in the longer version. 
Sophia is called our sister Sophia in the shorter version. The shorter version has epinoia or thought, afterthought, a manifestation of Sophia to teach Adam and Eve knowledge from the forbidden tree. In the longer version, it is Christ who does that. In other words, he performs the function of the serpent. Examples like this could be multiplied, but the basic point is clear. The various versions of the Apocryphon of John taken together show that the Christian elements are secondary. The basic text, apart from the Christian traditions, is an early Gnostic text that consists of innovative reinterpretations of biblical and Jewish traditions. Now, look in our, ad- <coughs> our uh, outline. The preamble and the apocalyptic frame, and then also the, at the end, the apocalyptic frame and title. Um, the Christianized version that we have now, uh, due especially to these framework elements, shows considerable influence from the Gospel of John in the New Testament. Indeed, the Apocryphon of John can easily be construed as an esoteric continuation of the Gospel of John, say a, a kind of chapter, uh, second uh, edition, I mean second ch- chapter or whatever, second volume, featuring post-resurrection revelations that continue the post-resurrection material in the Gospel of John, chapters 20 and 21. We also can note an interesting fact. This morning, uh, we heard about the uh, author of the Gospel of John. Uh, Well, there was a beloved disciple uh, and a scribe But the beloved disciple is nowhere mentioned, named in the Gospel of John. Now we know from the Apocryphon of John who that person is. He is Jesus' disciple John, son of Zebedee. This uh, reflects the second century tradition that identifies the anonymous author of the Gospel of John as the disciple John. So... I would suggest a late 2nd or early 3rd century date for the original Greek version of the Apocrypha of John as we now have it in Coptic translation. Now, in the Revelation Revelation Discourse 1a, the basic Gnostic myth begins with a description of the primal father. He is an invisible monad or unity who is above and beyond everything. Now, uh, the word description here is is not exactly uh, correct because much of this account consists of what we call a negative theology with a series of negative adjectives. Invisible, illimitable, unsearchable, immeasurable, ineffable, unnameable, so on. There is an interesting parallel to this particular passage in another of the Sethian tractates, Allogenes. But there are positive assertions as well about the uh, first person in the triad. He's light, life-giving, he's grace, and so on. Such assertions prepare us for the divine unfolding that begins with the first of a number of emanations. The first one being his thought, Greek ennoia. This is also called the first power. She's given the name Barbelo. She's also called mother, father, thrice male, the first to come forth, and so on. Thrice male, interesting, because she's a mother, but also a mother father. Um, as a the second uh, in the in the uh, scheme of things, uh, it is with her that the rest of the unfolding begins. Now, the the idea of the first thought of the divine noose, that's actually a feature from uh, later Platonism and even Aristotle. The first.
first power is called Barbelo, and people have tried to figure out what the etymology of that term might be. One of them that I like is a Hebrew one, Ba'ar Ba'el, God in four. <laughs> anyway, she becomes the initiator of further emanations granted by the Invisible Father. So, from her comes foreknowledge, indestructibility, eternal life, truth. She's also the mother of a divine son called Alo Autogenes, self-generated, self-begotten, from whom emanate additional entities, including the four luminaries, Harmoseo, Oroiel, Davithai, and Elelith. He's uh, in decreasing order. There's also the perfect man called Pigeratomas or Geratomas or just Adamas. Associated with each of the four luminaries are other eternal realms, eons, personifications of virtues or positive attributes such as grace, truth, and form, worth Harmozeo, conception or reflection, Epinoia, perception and memory with Oroyao, understanding, love, and idea with Davithe, perfection, peace, and wisdom, Sophia, with Eleleth. Now, Eleleth is the fourth in this series of light beings, and uh, wisdom is the last one of the emanations from Eleleth. The perfect man can clearly be seen as a heavenly projection of Adam. The virginal spirit, that is the father, places him over the first eon in association with Harmozeo. Geradamas then places his own son Seth over the second eon by the second luminary Oroiel. The seed of Seth, or the souls of the saints, as they are also called, are placed over the third luminary, Davithe, and the souls of those who come late to repentance are associated with Eleleth. All of these beings are said to glorify the invisible spirit. Now, <clears throat> and with that we're done with item A, 1 and 2. We turn now to item B in our outline. Then comes a tragic break within the heavenly world. Sophia, the youngest of the eons, desires to bring forth a likeness of herself without the consent of the invisible spirit and without a consort. And the result is an ugly being called Yaldabaoth. He is the first of the lower archons or rulers. From him comes twelve other archons and seven rulers over the seven heavens, that is the planetary spheres. The chief archon has two other names beside Yaldabaoth. Sakla, from Aramaic, which means fool. Samael, in Hebrew this means blind god. As for uh, the name Yaldabaoth, sometimes this is interpreted as the child of chaos, Yaldabaoth. Uh, I've also toyed the idea that it's uh, made up of a series of divine names, Yao, El, Sabaoth. Anyway, uh, a certain answer to that question I think is not possible. Now, <clears throat> part of the story, a very crucial one, uh, is the arrogant assertion that Yaldabaoth makes. I am God, and there is no other God beside me. A direct quotation from Isaiah 45 and 46. Additional archons are produced, a group of seven powers and 365 angels. Yaldabaoth then organizes the lower spatio-temporal cosmos. Seeing what he has created, he says, I am a jealous God, and there is no other God beside me. Well, who is being quoted in that passage? The 
Tractate's author remarks sarcastically that Yaldabo is ignorantly indicating to the angels that there really is another god. For if there were no other one, of whom would he be jealous? <laughs> the author says. Now, with this vain claim made by Aldabo, the topos that recurs in several other Gnostic texts of the same claim, we can very clearly see who this is. He is none other than the biblical creator of heaven and earth. There is indeed another de deity above him. But, interestingly enough, that deity too can easily be identified with the Jewish God. So what the Gnostics have done is split the biblical God into two. Now I pointed out in one of my articles that uh, some of the ways in which uh, the Invisible Father is is described uh, in, in that initial the theosophy bears very interesting relationship to a passage in Philo uh, of whom the same is said about God. I mean, of course, for him it was the creator, but but for uh, the author of the Apocrypha of John, this is the other God, the one that Tillich, Tillich, Paul Tillich refers to as the God beyond God. <clears throat> well, I don't think Tillich was a Gnostic, though, really. The myth continues with an extended commentary on key texts in the biblical book of Genesis with editorial comments explicitly contradicting what Moses said. The mother, that is Sophia, moves agitatedly to and fro, not over the waters, as Moses would have it, but in shame and repentance. The invisible spirit consents to her being elevated to the ninth sphere of heaven until she has corrected her deficiency. In this scheme of thing, the ninth is the next lowest uh, above the tenth, which is the highest. A voice comes from heaven and rebukes Yaldabaoth. Man exists and the son of man. Actually, uh, the way I look at this is that man, Anthropos, and the son of man uh, represent the invisible father on the one hand and the uh, divine Adam on the other. A luminous human formed image appears in the cosmic waters and Yaldabo says to his fellow archons, come let us create a man according to the image of God and according to our likeness that his image may become a light for us. And of course we, we recognize here immediately the first Genesis story uh, of creation 1 26 27 they then create a being of soul substance that they call Adam and each of the angels contributes something to his formation the longer version of the Apocrypha of John elaborates on this with 365 angels with very strange names contributing parts of Adam's body uh, and that long four-page passage is said to come from or be taken from uh, a book called the book of Zoroaster <laughs> but Adam remains lifeless until the mother Sophia contrives to retrieve the remaining power that she had given to Yaldabaoth by getting him to breathe into Adam life-giving breath when he does this Adam comes to life he's able to walk <laughs> and of course this uh, picks up the uh, story in the second creation story in Genesis 2 7 where God created uh, Adam from the dust of the earth and breathed into him the breath of life but by breathing into the new creation Adam uh, that spiritual power he had gotten from his mother he becomes ulti ultimately bereft of what had been left of that spiritual power that he had gotten from her. So, <clears throat> seeing that Adam's intelligence is now greater than that of those who made him, thanks to the spirit breathed into him, uh, 
Yaldabaoth and his archons throw him down into the lowest region of all matter. In other words, he takes on physical characteristics. Adam does. A helper is then sent to Adam, who is called Luminous Epinoia, Reflection, hidden in Adam, and she is also called Life, Zoe, in uh, the he- Coptic, which actually is a Greek word in Coptic. Uh, and that, of course, is Eve. She's called Zoe in the Septuagint Greek version of the Hebrew Bible. The archons then imprison Adam in a material body of darkness and death. But uh, notice the luminous epinoia sent to Adam as a helper. And this, of course, is one of the one of the ways in which uh, Eve is, is uh, depicted uh, in the creation story in the Bible. The archons then place Adam in paradise and encourage him to eat of their tree of life, which is really death, while trying to keep <coughs> Adam away from the tree of knowledge. Yaldabaoth know, makes another creature in the form of a woman, according to the likeness of the epinoia which had appeared to him. And part of the power of the man is brought into the female creature. So Adam and Eve eventually taste the perfect knowledge from the forbidden tree. The longer version has Christ, I, in dialogue with John, appearing in the form of an eagle on the tree to teach them and awaken them from sleep. This is obviously a Christianized Christian gloss. In the shorter version, it is Epinoia, a, a form of Eve, who appears in the form of an eagle on the tree and teaches knowledge to Adam and Eve. That's certainly the more original feature. The chief archon then casts Adam and Eve out of paradise. He seduces Eve and begets in her two sons, one with a bear face named Elohim and another with a cat face named Yahweh. <laughs> Yahweh he sets over fire and wind and Elohim over water and earth, the court four uh, elements. Yaldabaoth calls them Cain and Abel. Yaldabaoth both also plants sexual intercourse into Adam and Eve, inspiring them with his counterfeit spirit. Then <coughs> Adam begets the likeness of the Son of Man and calls him Seth. Here uh, we uh, compare Genesis 4.25. And uh, Seth is named after the heavenly race, the seed of Seth. And the mother sends down her spirit, which is in her likeness, and a copy of those who are in the play Roma. The product of Sophia here is unnamed, but may be seen possibly as an equivalent of Seth's consort sister, who is in other texts called Norea. There's one treatise that deals with her specifically, and another one, Hypothesis of the Archons, in which she figures. It is said that she will prepare a dwelling place for the eons which will come down, perhaps a reference to the totality of the Gnostic elect, the seed or the race of Seth. At this point in the text, there is an extended discussion of the destiny of human souls. This passage in the form of a catechism appears to be a secondary interpolation. Those of the immovable race of Seth on whom the spirit of life descends will be given eternal life. Ignorant souls in whom the counterfeit spirit is dominant will be reincarnated and given another chance. Apostate or unrepentant souls will be subject to eternal punishment. Now, now this particular passage uh, on the two kinds of souls is... uh, reminds me very much of a famous passage in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Rule of the Congregation featuring opposing spirits of light and darkness. 
The myth then continues with the old double oath bringing fate, or Greek hemarmene, destiny, and all sorts of evils upon humans, and then decides to bring about a flood. Noah and others from the immovable race are hidden in a luminous cloud. Yaldabo then sends his angels to the daughters of men, and they produce the counterfeit spirit by whom the whole creation becomes enslaved until now. Now this is a version of that story in Genesis 6 where the sons of men, uh, men come... Uh, come into the daughters of men but this is developed in a considerable way in the first book of Enoch uh, and uh, it's very clear that the Apocryphon of John in this, at this point is, is very much dependent upon that apocalyptic uh, Jewish apocalypse the myth in the shorter version of the Apocryphon of John concludes with a brief reference to the blessed mother father that is Barbelo who is rich in mercy and in whose seed she is taking form. The longer version has instead a concluding hymn featuring a threefold descent of an aspect of Barbelo called Pronoia or Providence. In this hymn, Pronoia speaks in the first person telling of her three descents into the realm of darkness that is this world. She is a savior figure, actually. Uh, in her third descent, she manages to awaken to Gnosis, the one who hears, that is, a representative of the Gnostic elect. The hymn concludes with Pronoia proclaiming her success. I raised him up and sealed him in the light of the water with five seals in order that death might not have power over him from this time forth. The sealing in water with five seals is a baptismal reference, ritual, and references made to that in several other Sethian texts. Uh, one of these texts the, uh, actually is, consists, the three stelies of Seth, cons, consists of a kind of liturgy uh, featuring the ascent of the soul. Immediately following, uh, by the way, with this uh, threefold descent of Pronoia, this is uh, uh, in another Nakamati text, the Protenoia, uh, triple Protenoia, she descends three times like Pronoia and then puts on Christ. So here's the kind of Christianization of a myth in which the re revealer uh, savior figure is a feminine person I mean, a feminine uh, version of the higher Sophia, Barbelo. But um, in a Christianized version, of course, Jesus has to perform all of the salvatory uh, functions. So then, uh, immediately following the hymn, the concluding frame story resumes with the Savior announcing his ascent to John. I shall go up to the perfect eon. I have completed everything for you and your hearing. This juxtaposition, juxtaposition of the two eyes, invites us to conclude that the editor of the longer version saw Christ as an incarnation of pronoia. And uh, as I've already indicated, that's what we find in trimorphic protenoia. She speaks in the first person of her threefold descent to the world. She announces at the end of her discourse, I put on Jesus. I bore him from the cursed wood and established him in the dwelling places of his father. The myth in the Apocryphon of John is obviously a very complicated one. It was probably developed from a simpler version. For example, Barbelo is clearly a Sophia or wisdom figure. As Enoya, the thought of the invisible father, she is comparable to the mythic Enoya found in the systems of Simon and Menander who are uh, described by Irenaeus. Simon uh, Magus, so-called, from Samaria, uh, had a consort that he, she, that he called Enoya. <clears throat> in the Apocryphon of John, this Sophia figure appears at several levels. Barbelo, then 
there's the younger Eon Sophia, whose fall results in the creation of the world. The restored Mother Sophia, Epinoia, reflection, Adam's helper, who also brings Gnosis to Adam and Eve. And, in the longer version, Pronoia, or Providence, who accomplishes the salvation of the Gnostic elect. Now, once again, I point out that th- th- this is a feminine figure who's performing the uh, uh, saving roles. Although Seth, Seth is named in the text both as a heavenly figure, as the son of Adam on earth, he plays no active role in bringing salvation to the elect Gnostics, even if their souls are seen to constitute the totality of the seed of Seth in the heavenly world. Well, <clears throat> I don't need to belabor the point that what we find in the Apocrypha of John is made up of uh, reinterpretations of Jewish traditions and most notably the Hebrew Bible. As to when and where the Sethian Gnostic myth uh, arose initially, uh, I would suggest either Antioch in Syria or Alexandria in Egypt sometime in the early 2nd century. The Apocryphon of John in its Christianized form is probably a product of late 2nd or early 3rd century Alexandria. Now, as to the so-called Sethians described by the Church Fathers, It turns out that the most reliable of the heresiologists, um, Irenaeus of Lyon, says nothing at all about Sethians. What he talks about are people who call themselves Gnosticoi. And then he also, in his description of the myth, talks about the seed of Seth. On the other hand, his description of the tenets of the Gnostics, adherents of the Gnostic school of thought, agree with much of what we have in the, prom- have in the primary sources uh, used by scholars to reconstruct a Sethian Gnostic system. So, I mean, as uh, I've already indicated, the text that he paraphrases in Against Heresies is parallel to the first part of the Apocrypha of John, after the framework. A number of the traditions included in Against Heresies 130 also have counterparts in the second part of the Apocrypha of John. So the evidence would lead us to conclude that the Sethians of the patristic writers did not exist as such, even though some of them uh, uh, describe a uh, heretic sect using the term Sethian, 